Welcome back. Today, exciting day, let me give you some announcements. Number one, no more formative assessments this year. Semester. I will not also, once class is over, you won't have any from me either. So I should have been just no more formative assessments in this class. Uh, number two, I reduced the number of items for homework three, in part because of the timing of when things will play out. I built this lecture yesterday, and uh, it was lengthy. So um, there's a section of homework three that I removed that talked about empirical priors. I will discuss those in class, but not enough time for you to do it in homework. After today's class, you'll have everything you need to do homework three, although next week's fall break, I don't expect you to work on it there. It's due the Friday following fall break. It's two analyses, basically. Okay, uh, okay. so let me just give you the plans for the semester also. This week is polytimus uh, response models, or models for order, uh, categorical data with more than two categories. That's another way of putting it. Uh, we'll do that both days this week. When we get back, we'll talk about multidimensional models and a little bit of identification methods that involves the priors and so forth too. And then the final week of class, we'll talk about model fit, posterior predictive checks, and the leave one out WAIC stuff. Okay? All right. The end is near of class, that is. Feels like. Okay. I'll have more information for you about projects and timing and stuff like that probably Friday. So, um, in terms of like when the projects do, I mentioned having potentially an optional um, presentation set, um, debating if we even do that or not. But we'll we'll get there. Okay, Friday, definitely Friday. I always, always like to say when I was growing up, why do something today that you can put off until tomorrow? Right? Procrastination. No. Okay. Any questions for me on what we covered last time? You recall last time we just ended, it was like IRT festival, right? Festival of models. And today is going to continue that party. It's a festival. So let's have the slides. I'm going to use them in the browser this time uh, rather than in R. So today we're talking about modeling observed polytimus data. We'll use the conspiracy data again. There's some interesting features of this now, right? Because the conspiracy data, we started with the normal assumption. And then we, we took the detour to dichotomous items to talk about IRT for a little bit. And these data, comparing the full, the full responses with normal distributions versus dichotomizing our data is sort of comparing two different things entirely, right? Because we transformed our data before we put it into IRT. Today, we're leaving the data as they are. We're going to treat each category separately. One, two, three, four, five. So now we do have a direct comparison with what we did for the IR, with the, the, the normal distribution or confirmatory factor analysis approach that we started a few weeks ago. Okay, so you know the questions. I have them there always, and so the, the lectures stand alone. We don't need to talk about that. But I did want to just discuss where we did the CFA analyses before, sometimes called confirmatory factor analysis. You remember the code for this, right? We, uh, we said, assumed every item we can have only one factor. We'll, we'll change that when we get back, by the way. But every item measures that factor. And the way we form the model is, this, is as if we had observed the factor itself. And then each item becomes its own separate regression model, right? So each item has an item intercept, a factor loading or discrimination. Uh, and that factor loading or discrimination multiplies the factor score itself. And in the normal outcomes model, we often put an error term there on the model line. But you remember that that's sort of a weird part because when we coded it in STAN, the normal distribution had two components, right? There's a mean part and a standard deviation part. The conditional mean is this part, intercept plus factor loading times factor score. And then the, the error term, we said followed a normal distribution with a zero mean and some unique variance. That the, the standard deviation version of this, without the squared term, showed up in Stan's code in the second argument to the normal function. Remember that, that? And the big thing, though, is the normal distribution had two parameters, right? There was the mean parameter, there was the standard deviation parameter. And 
we started talking about generalized models. And we saw last time the Bernoulli distribution has one parameter. <laughs> so today we're going to do it a little bit differently. Finally, remember this plot? The problem with the CFA model, it, in addition to the CFA model pretending the data were continuous, right? So the CFA model assumption is that a score of 4.5 is perfectly legitimate. We only have integers, though. Um, the other problem is that the model itself quickly gives you prediction functions that fall outside of the bounds that are possible. So we're going to fix that today. Any, any questions on any of this? All right. I love polytomous data distributions. If you, I teach you normal because people use normal. But if you're doing this with your own data, don't ever use normal if you're in Bayes' world. All right, the reason to use normal sort of goes away almost entirely because it's just as easy to code a polytomous distribution, particularly in STAN, to match the data appropriately. So polytomous distributions are where you should go if you have truly discrete data. So um, the thing I'm trying to get to emphasize in this class is matching the model assumptions to the data characteristics, right? That's a very easy, there's still assumptions that we have to check, we haven't even checked yet, like model fit. But from a very basic point of view, we know our data have discrete responses on a small set of known categories, uh, where some of those item, like if we look at the marginal distribution of the, of the item responses, they're mul potentially multimodal, right? Usually one big mode, but then there's like a, sometimes a little peak on the other side, but they're not a uh, uni, uni, single peak. There's, there may be multiple modes to the data. And I mention that because we need these characteristics to match in a choice of distribution when we go and look for it, okay? So we need a distribution that is capable of modeling a small, known, a small set of known categories. So it needs to be discrete, needs to have a well-defined number attached to each category. Uh, and the main thing is there's a fixed upper bound. This differs from, for instance, any data that you collect that have counts, right? A count variable potentially has no upper limit. In practice, yes, there is an upper limit. Uh, if you ask people the number of um, times they check their phone, let's do that one. <laughs> times they check their cell phone in a day, right? Um, you're going to have a range. Those are all discrete outcomes, right? I, I, you, you can't half check your phone, right? It's either check it or you didn't, right? Um, but you'll note that there's no, we haven't defined what the upper limit should be, right? And in theory, you could have a person who checks their phone, I don't know, thousands of times a day, right? I mean, so you could have, you know, approximate what even functionally an infinity might be. That's a very different setup than saying, here's an item, you have to pick one of these five categories to characterize your belief in the item, right? So do you see the difference between the two, right? So for us, the types of distributions we're going to pick specify the set of categories with a small number usually ahead of time. Now, if you're in a situation where you have a count variable, there are count distributions for that, distributions, discrete distributions that work for that, just we won't have time to cover them in this class. But you could do that as well too. And Stan has them. Okay? And in fact, if you take the generalized modeling framework that I'm trying to teach you in this class, you might be like, hey, Stan has the Poisson distribution. I know Poisson might have enough, no upper limit. How do I use a Poisson distribution for my analysis if I have a count variable in my data? Sorry. All right, questions? Okay. The other thing that we may have to worry about is possible multimodality from a distribution. It would be the ideal of a distribution would allow for not just a single peak, but we're gonna build toward that. So there are a whole bunch of discrete distributions. If you look on the STAN user guide here, that is really tiny. Can you see that? Is that a little bit better? Okay. 
these are <laughs> bounded discrete distributions. Um, actually, I can already tell a mistake. So this, word, this, this sentence right here is actually incorrect. It says, bounded discrete probability functions have support, that's the range, between zero and up to n for some upper, bo upper bound of n. Because when you click on categorical distribution, it actually says it needs to be between one and n. So depending on the distribution, it's either one or zero for where the lower bound is. But for each of these distributions, we can actually, oh my goodness. I didn't hyperlink, there we go. I'll go through each. The binomial distribution. We know the binomial distribution. We've talked about it before. It's the distribution from interest statistics where you talked about the number of successes out of number of trials. We don't have trials and successes, but we can actually use this for our benefit. And I'm going to show you how. Nobody really does it, but it's actually a pretty flexible distribution. The pro is it's very easy to use, uh, very easy to code. And it turns out it has the same number of parameters as like the IRT or normal distribution models too. So for the same number of parameters, like it doesn't cost you any more parameters. The, the con of it is it's unimodal. A binomial distribution always has a single peak. So if we have data that have a little bit of a peak somewhere else, it may not fit those data well. Then there's a beta binomial distribution. Um, those of you who've taken Lisa's generalized class, you may have heard of it there, you've seen it there. Um, we don't often see it in psychometrics, although you could put it in psychometrics. Um, it generalizes the binomial distribution, have a different probability for each trial, basically. Uh, there's a hypogeometric distribution, forget that. Uh, we don't use that. Hypergeometric is what we would describe as um, like the lottery. Recently there was a lot of money in the one of the lotteries here, Powerball. I don't play lottery. But, uh, I only gamble in the stock market, all right? Let's just, let's just be real, right? But uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? So basically there's a set of, you, you have a ticket, there's a set of numbers, right? They're drawing six balls at random from a pile of whatever. What's the probability that your draw comes out? We use a hypergeometric for that. I can't think of an item where that would make sense from a psychometric point of view, so we can forget that for right now. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And in fact, it'd be kind of fun to look at, but you know, it's on my, my bucket list of psychometric models to create is hypergeometric. And one of them, the other bucket list item is one with a, a complex imaginary number in it. That would be fun too. I haven't gotten there yet. I, if I do both of those, I will retire. Okay. Uh, then there's a categorical distribution, which is sometimes called multinomial. Um, this is actually the most frequently used distribution. Turns out, if you took IRT class and you started talking about polytomous response distributions in IRT, they're all under this distribution right here. I'm pretty sure when you took IRT and you talked polytomous, you didn't have the binomial, did you? Probably not. Sometimes it shows up. Um, I'll show you why this is it. It seems to be the most flexible as we go forward. And then Stan actually describes a discrete range distribution um, if you look at the code for it, I would just call it a uniform distribution. Each category has an equal probability of being selected, so you figure out how many categories you have. And anyway, I don't know why we would use that in psychometrics either, but if you have a, that doesn't mean that it is not possible. I just haven't thought of why. Any questions? All right. So why I say that? If you go to the stand functions manual, that's not what I wanted. Stan itself, if you look at the manual, on the left, it talks about just discrete distributions and then continuous distributions. Pretty much, you could come up with a psychometric model to use any of those four. So what I'm trying to teach you in this class is we, we are taking very specific distributions, but that doesn't mean what we do in psychometrics is only limited to that. What I think should govern you is, again, the idea that we were talking about, not that one, is the data characteristics should match with the distribution characteristics. If they don't match, then there's a problem. And that's why I say CFA assumptions really aren't kosher or cool or awesome for, I don't know where kosher came from. They're just not, they don't match, right? We don't have a continuous outcome. Um, there are people who will say, but if you have enough categories, it starts to approximate it, yes. 
But then we may have multimodality, which a normal distribution doesn't have either. Anyway. Okay, so we're going to dive into one a different place to start. I'm going to teach you the binomial distribution model to begin with. Because again, I'm trying to get you to generalize what you're learning. I can't cover all the models. Heck, I can't cover almost everything in class. Everything takes way longer than I um, wished it would. Not that that's uh, anybody's fault, it's just how I teach and what I do. Um, it's my fault, if anybody. So, but what I'm trying to do with the binomial model is number one, if you have a little bit of data, it works really quickly and really well. Number two, it, it, it will allow us to step into the discrete distributions. But number three, this is an example of pulling a distribution off of a book or a user manual and saying, you know, that might fit my data. Let me see how I can make a psychometric model work for it. So that's how we're going to start there, right? So if you're thinking in the back of your head, I got this survey and, you know, maybe I'm working with someone at the med school and they're talking about patient reported outcomes. And then on the last week, how many times did you have this event occur? That's a count. Okay, I didn't teach you that, but you know what? There are count distributions, unbounded discrete distributions. You could go find one of those and follow the same process to try to map the psychometric model onto it. All right? Okay, let's talk binomial. Um, I say it's one of the easiest to use for psych uh, polydomous items. That's a, a really loaded word. I shouldn't have put that in there. I try to argue against putting easy in my slides because I remember being in grad school where the professor would say, Rod McDonald would say, oh, this, everybody, or, you know, it's, it's well, widely recognized, or, you know, that type of stuff. No, not really. But if you're in Stan already, if you've already gone through the learning curve of getting to Stan, which was not easy, is not easy, but assuming you're there, conditional on you understanding Stan and a little bit of psychometrics, it's a little bit more straightforward. But let's talk about this binomial distribution. Um, this is the the probability mass function, which is the discrete version of a pr uh, probability density function. So when we used to say PDF for the distribution function, this is the version of it for discrete data. Right? So <coughs> sometimes you call this PMF, but it's, it's basically the same thing. The height represents a probability because it's a discrete trial, but that is the same as we would call a likelihood in a continuous distribution. I mean, it functions the same in our likelihood functions. Let's put it that way. Um, so the parameters here that you see, there's an N, there's a Y, and there's, there's a P. And of course, I didn't change my slide after I did it. That K should be a Y through there. And of course, I can't fix it right now, but this right here should be Y. So it's N choose Y. This, this first term right here is combination. N choose Y times p to the y over 1 minus p, or times 1 minus p to the n minus y. So each of those are y's. So let's talk about from where you'd read a stat book what this means. A stat book meaning like you know, where you'd like typically encounter this first. We say n, we use this distribution to characterize like an experiment, let's put it that way, of uh, you have a set number of trials N is the number of trials. Y is the uh, thing you're looking for. So remember that if we have a rolling a die and we're looking for the number one showing up and I have to roll it 10 times, N would be 10. And Y would be the number of times I observed a one. Okay? Then P is the probability of observing a one on any of those 10 trials. So to us, um, P is very much what we're used to modeling. It's the same P for each of the trials also. Now, um, this distribution is very similar to Bernoulli. Because in Bernoulli, N equals 1. Right? So when N equals 1, the combination out in front is always one. One choose zero and one choose one, both equal one. And what we're left with is P to the event, one or zero, times one minus P to one minus the event, which is one or zero. Right, so that's the Bernoulli distribution that we talked about last week. So binomial 
is like a generalized version of a Bernoulli. A Bernoulli is a one-trial binomial. Right? So those words will come back again when we get to the categorical distribution and multinomial. We will be right there. But the mean of this distribution is n times p. Right? So think about that. When n equals 1 in Bernoulli, the mean would be just the probability, which is what we were modeling last week. So this is the next generalization of what we did last week. And again, the variance, if you know the mean, you know the variance, right? P times 1 minus P is what we saw last week. That was when N equals 1. When N is bigger than 1, it's just N times P times 1 minus P. So you've seen this before. Does this fit with psychometrics? Sometimes. Sometimes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some PhD. I always like to say this. Put the PH in the PhD. Let's do some philosophy here, right? Maybe you're not, not wanting the philosophy, but let's, let's do some thinking here. Uh, if we did, if IRT is based on Bernoulli distributions, and Bernoulli distributions are one trial binomial, does it make sense to say, yeah, I could see how it could generalize. To, you know, I, could, I could have multiple trials. Yeah. Just thought, thought, food for thought. Put it up. All right. We can actually adapt this for item response model. The whole setup for it, the events out of trials, you know, Y successes out of N trials is the misleading quantity to it. The bigger picture is the math behind it, right? The math behind it suggests a probability for each one of a set of discrete outcomes. Right? Those discrete outcomes range from zero up to the number of trials. Right? So in our data, we had five categories. Now we numbered them one, two, three, four, five, but we could have numbered them zero, one, two, three, four, couldn't we? Right? So we numbered them zero, one, two, three, four. There's still five categories. The number actually doesn't make a difference. Right? It's arbitrary, where we start, where we end it. So this model, if we look at the score of an item, of the selection of a category, one through five, this model provides a probability of that score occurring. Right? It's weird, but it's true. We could do it. Weird if you think of successes and trials. Right? Every item is a five trial, or excuse me, a four trial experiment. And, you know, you might have three successes if you agree with it. That doesn't sound appropriate. But that's only because the language that we've grown up or built around to teach binomial distributions. The math behind it works. So, if we do that, we just need to recode our data. So, the item response goes from zero up to four. So, we just take our data minus one. That's it. So now we know the highest value for each item is 4, so the end is 4. And now we can go and take that probability and do the same thing to it that we did with the probability for Bernoulli. Put a link function on it, and in, in the continuous part of the link function, model it with our latent variable. How's that sound? I think that's cool, right? I don't know, for me it is. Here it's a logit link. This is actually the inverse link, as you know it to be. But in here, I've got, I've got a typo of LaTeX, an extra one, pardon my typo. Um, we have our item intercept, item discrimination or slope, and our latent variable itself. So there, we can actually do this. We could, we could code it with slope intercept form. We could actually make it discrimination difficulty if we like that better. Uh, we could actually include a C parameter or a D parameter if we wanted. There's all sorts of ways. Once we have a probability, this function is just like we know in IRT. And the cool thing about this is now we have a model for polynomous data <laughs> that works like IRT. We just change the distribution and it, fit, and it works. Now it may not fit very well. It probably won't fit better than the multinomial, but if you are in a case where you have a limited amount of data, the nice thing is this doesn't have any more parameters. It doesn't penalize you in many ways. So, any questions?
Anybody seen this before? Lisa may teach you. Yeah? Can you repeat the interpretation of the probability word estimate? Okay, so interestingly, that probability from a binomial we're taught is the probability of any success on any one of those trials. The way you can make it work in psychometrics, I accidentally stumbled upon when I was a grad student because I was working on a project and they said, so we've got this complicated diagnostic model, um, we need it for polytomous data, and we need to not have very many more parameters. How do we do it? And actually it didn't look anything like this version of the model. The students who are learning DCMs from me, um, this was before the LCDM showed up. So it was all in probabilities. So what I had proposed was, if you think of a polytomous item, so in our case, um, we have four trials, right? So if we were to take an item and break it into four uh, binary items, zeros and ones, and we, and so let's imagine, uh, Vladimir, you gave me a three on your response. So your four, I would take that item, make it four binary items, and I would randomly put three ones somewhere in the four. You with me? So basically I can convert everybody's polytomous data to a bunch of binary data. What that probability is, is the probability that would be the same of any of those four sampled items themselves, right? So it's the probability that if we were to think of your responses coming from four binary items, the probability any one of those binary items is equal to one. Does that help? It's a little weird. So I, I was at Illinois, you know, trying my best to figure stuff out. And I did that and I coded it and I made the constraint that the probabilities were equal. So basically we just took our binary estimation system for binary data and we, I just basically created what I called pseudo items. So I would take polytomous items and make them into these binary ones. And I made it so that the estimation system would have a cross item constraint so the probabilities would be equal for those pseudo items. And it worked and it gave the same result. So that's where I learned it. Yeah. So here the, the number of trials will be four and the number of successes will be, will be your, your th response. That's right. Okay. That's right. And remember the response now goes from zero to four. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. So this is our PDF. This is our model data likelihood for one item. We know n is always four. I should just put a four there. We have our item response here. This is where we put the probability. This is one minus the probability. And each of these other terms, this is the number, this is your response, and this is four minus the value of your response. But this now tells us for any given value of theta, we can calculate the probability someone answers with a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four. Right? This will give it all to us, and they'll sum to one for each person. How's that work with you? So because this is very similar to what we did in normal distribution world, we can use the same priors. Although we saw in IRT, it, we can use the same priors. We have a little bit more of that worry of the multimodality when we have, we have to use starting values the right way. But I'm just going to pretty much use the same code here. And likewise, I'm going to identify the latent variable to scale of normal zero one. Remember, at the end of n the week after Thanksgiving, I'll talk about changing that as we go forward to. Any questions on this? OK. I point, anybody online have any questions? So how do we make this work? Turns out very few changes in STAN. As I mentioned, if you already went through the learning curve to learn STAN and some of the models we're doing, it's a matter of changing a normal distribution for binomial. So now our item, Y, follows a binomial distribution. Now in STAN, if you go and look at their help, this help here, if you go to binomial distribution, you will see that a bunch of, uh, this is the function I'm using, binomial n and theta, you'll see there's two arguments there. n is the number of trials. In our case, it's the max item response minus the number one, right? So it's zero to four. Four for every one of our items. 
and then theta is the probability, right? And turns out they actually have a binomial logit that takes something on the logit scale, applies the inverse logit transform to it, and then puts it in the binomial, just like we saw on um, bino or Bernoulli logit from the last time. But I'm just using binomial to keep it the same. So that means I have to convert the term in that second part to a probability to make it work. Okay? So going back. So here, if you have items that have different numbers of categories, you can specify a different maximum for each. All right? This is the end. So if we don't, we have all five categories for items. If we had one category, one item that had three, we would just tell it three. Ironically, if all of our items had a max category of one, or I guess two, I guess what two minus one, one, if we put a one there, this all becomes the same as IRT. So in theory, we could have used the same, this same code for IRT and just told it the max for each is one. It's one trial. And then, uh, you remember the inverse logit function. It takes a continuous number and puts it into a probability. It puts it into that e over 1 plus e function. Right? Here we put our psychometric model. Item intercept for the item plus uh, discrimination times latent variable. And you'll see here, this code does also, like we did in IRT world, we don't have the observation here. This is vectorized code. So that means we don't need to specify it. When we get to certain components at the end of this week, we will not be, I haven't figured out how to vectorize. I felt like I was close, but then I ran out of time. And I felt like it would be a really bad excuse for me to tell you, sorry guys, I don't have a lecture today because I was trying to vectorize the code. That violates the first root of, rule of coding is first make it work, then make it work fast, right? Make it work correctly, and then make it work fast and correctly. So it's, it's gonna work slower at the end of the week, but this is vectorized. So one other part on this, the note is that the binomial function itself expects y to be, um, the outcome here to be an integer. And it doesn't necessarily say that right in everything here. The, the function's reference doesn't actually tell you what it expects it to be. So a trial and error, when you break it, if you put it in, remember we had to put in the data as an integer array. Do you remember this? I'll show it in a slide. Any questions on this? Yes. Uh, I have a question about the weakness of MLE on only some of items. Yeah. For example, whenever I use the point estimation like a MLE on only some of items, the category, the per category doesn't include any damper size to estimate some parameter. Right. So the Bayesian covered that issue. Potentially, but not always. So when we get to the multinomial distribution, that'll come up. Um, the, the, the more general cases of these models have a, pro a parameter that, that reflects the, basically a, it's a conditional amount of people who are in each, each group. If you have, have not observed people or observed very few people, those parameters are very difficult to estimate. If you've observed zero people, technically there's no likelihood. To, it's like an infinite likelihood, right? Anything's possible. So those parameters, those threshold parameters or um, intercept parameters, depending on how you define them, become very difficult with small sample sizes. In Bernoulli, pardon me, binomial, we don't need those <laughs> because it uses the binomial distribution to assume what people would be based on that distribution assumption. Now, that distribution assumption may not be correct but when you have small amounts of data, this is an easy way to avoid having to worry about prior distributions defining the entire posterior likelihood. Hope that helps a little bit. Thank you for your question. Other questions? So yeah, I, I actually found this, if you code the, this, I don't know, how many of you have run a Polydemus IRT model and have it not converge, like an ML? And partially, part of that reason is you may have very small end counts in some of the categories. And what did you do when you had that happen? For me, I recoded. 
Right? I'd be like, oh, it's category two and category three now. Right? Like just pool, pool a couple of the categories. Um, there's no easy option out of that, right? Because you have a category in your data that nobody is, or very, you haven't sampled enough people to get enough responses to be there. So the Bayes solution to it is use a different prior distribution, but we know philosophically, we are just defining, we're just gonna, but, but the prior is gonna be our guess. It's gonna be, it's gonna dominate the analysis. So the result will look very much like the prior. The alternative is use a different distribution. So I hope that helps a little bit. Or recode your data. So all of it is less than ideal. <laughs> but it's ways of going. Other questions? All right, let's talk about the model parameters block. Here uh, we have theta, mu, and lambda. This is identical to the slope intercept version that we had in IRT. And let's talk about the data block. This is also pretty much identical. Again, y is an array, right? So we have an array within items and then observations. It's an integer. We specify as an integer. Last time, I told it the lower was zero and the upper was one. This time I'm just saying lower zero because the upper, if I used upper one and we put in a two, it will throw an error, so I just left that off. And then finally, um, I have a, an array representing what the, the highest category is um, and the lower value is zero. So this is, remember, we've recoded our data from one through five to just subtract one, so zero to four. So. Uh, in theory, we could, we, well, it would be terrible to have a zero category item. That's actually not data, right? <laughs> imaginary data. So I subtracted one from all of my items. Here's a check. The first item's contingency table. And you can see my responses are uh, from zero to four. Okay? Yes? Uh, in the previous slide, the number of observations no, in this case, the number of observations is just the sample size that we have. Okay. So for each item, max item is the number of trials. And I put that in quotes. Okay. It is what the Bernoulli distribution knows to be the n, the mm -hmm. n parameter in it. So that's what we're doing. So each item, where we look at number of trials, we look at each item. We see how many categories. All of ours had five. Mm -hmm. We subtract one from it. That's the number of trials per item. Okay. Does that help? Thank you for your question. Yeah, the language doesn't map. We're in, so this is an interesting part, right? You, and this lecture is very unique from the distinction of where models emanated, right? Binomial doesn't get used in psychometrics very much. So if you're familiar with psychometric language, we don't talk of events and trials. So it's weird. When we get into graded response models, well, if you were in statistics, you'd know those as uh, ordinal logistic models or proportional odds models. You wouldn't call them graded response. The only reason they're graded response, if you think of what is a graded response? Oh, that has something to do with grading a paper. It's an educational thing, right? So when you look at the names of it, this is where the names get in the way a little bit. That's at least for me. Hope that helps a little bit. There are no trial error number of trials, it's just an upper N for each item in this case. Okay, oh my goodness, why does it do that? All right, so we call the stand the same way. Here again, I have the init function to keep the factor loadings positive. Remember that, that crazy, that X picture that we had with all the slopes? We don't want that happening. By the way, that was also that also popped up in the nominal response that I was coding yesterday. Not a pleasant afternoon. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Just keep the slide 16. Oh, apologies. Oops. Can you explain the second box to there you have max items? This right here is filling the array to tell Stan what the maximum quantity is per item. So when I flip to R here. So the apply function, uh, we, we supply, this is dichotomous. I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong folder. Of course I am. 
Vladimir, one moment, please. <laughs> Dang it. I thought I had, uh, there's, I think I told you as you, we were starting, there's always something I don't do right when I set this thing up. This time, I grabbed last time's folder. So I will open the file, it'll just take a moment. And then I will load the data, and we will, I will show you this. And I really don't want to update it because I'm afraid of it not working. All right. No, that's not what I wanted. This one. There we go. Okay, let me get to that part of the output right here. That's CFA. Okay. So, this is our data, the conspiracy items binomial. If I wanted to get a mean for each or a maximum value for each, what I'm doing is I'm applying the function maximum to all 10 of the items. And this apply function does so without having to use a loop. So this is like saying if I did a loop from i equals 1 to 10, and then I saved each item's maximum, so max of that item, that's what this is doing. Thank you. So that's a list? This is not a list. This is, it, it re, uh, the apply function actually returns just an, an atomic vector, just a numeric vector. And so in stand code, the, the value I'm importing is, an, is a one-dimensional array which matches that that's this array of numbers in R. In this case, um, here, max item, if I look at the class of it, it's numeric, so it's a numeric vector. Does that help? All right, how are we doing? Jonathan, a yes. quick question to follow that. Yeah. Um, for that, would we want to avoid having our missing data coded as, say, 99, and we want to keep it as an A, or would we deal with the missing data prior to? Yeah. Uh, stay tuned for missing data. Stan <laughs> will not want any of it. Um, so I need to put that actually on my list somewhere in the week after Thanksgiving, I'll have how to handle missing data. Basically, the idea is this, Cass. You need to um, tell Stan which observations are present in your data. And I'll show you how to do that when we get out, uh, when we get back. Okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I know you're you're doing missing data <laughs> in the following week, so. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't have it on my list, so I need to I need to do that. Let me just make a note to myself, put in caps here. Missing data. No, the um, so so the answer to that for this week is just don't have missing data. Okay. Yeah. Problem solved. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> okay. So none of you have missing data. Deal. Great. Now, if you have missing data, hold on. It's it's going to be a little more complicated. But I, I figured out how to vectorize it. Also, um, you want me to tell you the shortcut now while I'm on it. So for each variable, you need to supply Stan with, a, with, a, with an array that describes which observations are observed and not missing. And then in the Stan code right here, that array gets put right in that spot right there. So now what it does, instead of looping over all the observations, it only loops over the observations that are observed. That's how you can shortcut the missing data part of the stand. There are other ways as well, too. Um, I'm trying to avoid having to do what, what's in the stand manual, which is a double loop, looping over items and people. We will actually end up doing that in the nominal response model, but that's later on. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. All right. It's coming, I promise. I. Actually, I don't even know if I'm ever going to get there. <laughs> We're going to get missing data. You need it. There's some of you doing class projects on it. <clears throat> we'll find a way. I have to remember, I can't teach you everything in this class. And I acknowledged that when I first started. It just feels like a personal letdown, like I'm letting each of you down. But I will tell you this. Um, I'll give you as much as I can and try to prepare you for how to read what's out there. And then afterwards, if you have questions, you're always welcome to come find me to answer them. OK? Uh, I may not be present. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I might be, you know, on a desert island in the spring because it's cold outside. But, you know, never mind. All right, moving on.
Other questions on data, any of that stuff? All right, let's look at results here. Um, first of all, we check convergence. It converged. Woohoo! I like convergence. Worked pretty well. Um, we also can see a bunch of the, these are on logits still. So these are interpreted like we would the slope intercept form in IRT. So you want to do a little bit of minor interpretation on this? Let's try that. What does negative 0.842 represent? This is the intercept. So remember, that's the, va the value of the logit for a theta at zero. Now we know that we set the mean of theta to zero. So we could say a person of average belief in conspiracies has a log odds of negative 0.842, or if we convert that to a probability, uh, this is their probability for any one trial for them to say yes. So remember, we have four trials, right? So they have a 30% chance of saying yes to any one. Now remember how we found the mean, though. Right, what is the mean in binomial? It's n times this number. So if we wanted to know what we expect them to do, we'd take the number 4, which is our n, and we would say we would expect somebody with an average theta to respond on average with a 1.2. Now, remember, 1.2 in binomial really means we got to add 1 to it to put it back on the scale of what we're used to. So we expect, on average, them to have a response of like 2.2, which is somewhere between disagree and neutral, on average. It's not a discrete integer, but it's on average. Does that help? And then we interpret the slope in the same way. That means for every one unit increase in theta. Now, we know that we standardize theta. So that means for every one standard deviation increase in theta, that that log odds goes up by 1.1, what we see there. So it's the same interpretation that we would see, almost the same in IRT. It's a little bit weirder to get to what it means on data. We have to go through that backtracking onto the 0 to 4 scale and then move that 0 to 4 up 1. But there are ways you can plot it. <laughs> so this is an option characteristic curve. I'm pretty sure you've heard that term before. right? This tells you, for any given value of theta, this is item 10's curves here, this tells you the probability a person selects each one of those options in our data. And I've put this onto option 1 through 5. All right, so we can think about that. Remember, option 5 is strongly agree. Somebody, th the option 5 is not most likely to be selected up until about almost uh, one and a half standard deviations above the mean. And if you want to see that same curve for the very first item, let me just change that to item one. And rescale here. There we go. Actually, let me replot. There we go. All right, so this is the same item one. This item. What was it? I don't remember what it was. Anyway, weird conspiracy theory that, you know, this had the most frequent number of people who were agreeing with it. I remember that. Uh, and you can see the probability for each of those. So this looks very much, where have you seen these plots before? Which models? Greater response, nominal response, partial credit. We can do the same thing with Bernou uh, binomial also. So it looks very much the same. The key difference, though, is that where each of these lines overlap, where they're located in and binomial, is there's no parameters for it. It's set by the assumption of the binomial distribution. Whereas when we get into a graded response or a nominal response model, there are parameters that sort of govern where those peaks or where those overlaps of likelihoods or probabilities fall. All right, so that's the big difference between binomial and not. How are we doing? All right. Other questions online? All right. Yes. Uh, 
for the plot. So, how can we calculate all those lines? Just apply the linear model? Yeah, let me show you. I'm glad you would ask. Um, so, I, uh, I take the, um, there we go. I take the summary. So remember the summary statistics are the posterior mean and the posterior uh, for each of the parameters. So I select just the parameters involved in that item. I calculate a theta, just a generic theta that goes between, I'd said negative three and three. And then for each, um, for each value of theta, I calculate the, the P parameter in the binomial, right? So let me flip back real quick. This term right here, right? So I just use an IRT model function to calculate it. So that's the probability. So this probability right here, I have one for every value of theta that I created, right? Theta, this sequence right here is my theta. So then <clears throat> what I end up doing is because of this probability is the core parameter in the binomial distribution. What I need, I could do it two ways. I could use a built-in R function to do this, or I could literally calculate this probability based on the likelihood function. I chose the easy way, <laughs> which was R. By the way, I believe in base R functions. Uh, I don't believe in someone else's package usually, but I believe in base R. So base R. I've been known, I've been, been friends with base, well, frenemies with base R since a long time, right? But the D binome function gives us, for a given probability, what the probability of observing a set number of trials are. So I have five options. I actually call that trial zero, x being zero to four. And then for each one of those, I build a matrix of probabilities for each response. So this matrix Y right here, for every theta, gives me the probability of selecting a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four. And that's how I build it. Does that help answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions on that? Glad you asked that, though. I like this plot. Not that it's anything unique, but <laughs> you, can, you can always have plots of data, right? I like this next plot even better. This is the expected value for the response on the scale of the data from 1 to 5. This is the same plot that I built here. That's the CFA expected value. This is the binomial expected value. Which one do you think seems more appropriate? Remember the blue lines or where the item limits are. Because we have the logit function that shuts off, at least it would say, shuts off the prediction. When we backtrack this to figure out what the mean response conditional on theta is, we get this plot. And just to be clear, the plot previous to this, I was looking for the probability for each option. Technically, we could come up with what the mean is, the expected response is for any theta, right? The expected value is the number times the probability summed across each of those options, right? So if I look at uh, what's the expected value for a theta of two, I find the probability of option one, multiply that by one, add to that the probability of option two, multiply that by two, and so forth. And we get our expected value plot. So, Two things notable about this, the red line is where the EAP estimate happens to be. That's with the summary, the posterior means. The black lines are from every posterior draw. And with not a lot of data and very uninformed of the priors, we're gonna see quite a bit of, um, I like to call it wiggle. Yeah, quite a lot of variability of where that ICC looks. But you'll note, this is an ICC that's not ranging between zero and one but it's the same content, right? In IRT, we talk about an item characteristic curve. 
we're plotting the expected value of the item conditional on theta on the data scale. It's a probability. Here we're plotting the expected value of the item on the data scale conditional on theta, but because the item goes between one and five, it's no longer a, a probability. It's still the same concept, it just applies to a different function. How are we doing? Questions on that? So which one do you like better? Do you like this plot or do you like the, uh, the CFA plot? Better yet. Not, I mean, they're both beautiful plots, don't get me wrong. It's base R, right? The subtle beauty, a minimalist beauty about base R. Kind of like a minimalist, like trying to survive in the woods. <laughs> Doesn't have all the rustic. We call R, R, maybe R stands for rustic, right? It's just very limited. But um, that being said, this plot and that other plot is, um, I don't know, this, this goes to tell you that sort of the assumptions in the data are being met at least a little bit more. We still haven't checked all of them. This, at least our distribution maps the scope of the data themselves. Any questions on this plot? Let's talk a little bit about the other estimates. Here are the distribution of beta estimates. You'll note this will look very similar to what we found in normal. I didn't compare it though. Uh, what some of the similarities are though, there is a, a very distinct lower bound. This is for people who pick zero, or in our case, the lowest option for every one of the items. Here's two posterior estimates of theta. So one of the other features that I wanted you to think about when you do different distribution for different psychometric models is what it implies about the shape of the, dis the posterior distribution. In the normal distribution model, the shapes vary, but by not mu that much. It was, it was only because of sampling that they varied. In IRT, or by Bernoulli data, they varied quite a bit, right? The theta, the standard deviation, posterior standard deviation, the uncertainty, conditional standard error of measurement depends on theta. You've heard of that before. They vary somewhat here in, in binomial, somewhere in between. But you can see uh, the person's, the, the, the theta one here estimate and theta two's estimate are, theta one's a little bit wider in our, what we think the, post, the standard deviation of theta could be. Any thoughts on this one? And this plot I like a lot. This also shows that um, the location of theta, this is the posterior mean of theta, and this is the standard deviation of theta. By the way, when I say I like these plots, it's not like I'm a little proud of myself. Ooh, I made a plot. It's more, I like the information it's displaying. Trying to get the point across. I'm always proud of my, actually, no, that's not true. I struggle with like, like being crit self-critical a lot, right? I'd like to be my own toughest critic. Uh, so as I'm saying this, I'm realizing, whoo, I'm proud, I made a plot. Okay, Jonathan, way to go, buddy. <laughs> I could see my son saying something like that. Anyway, um, this right here shows you what we expect in a typical item response model, right? That the mean of theta, or the expected, the, the point estimate of theta, and the, the, the variance around that point estimate depends on where the estimate is. This is like the, the, the flip of having a information function, right? This is sort of the inverse of it. What this is telling us is we're most precise at measuring theta somewhere around one standard deviation above the mean. Right? But there's a clear nonlinear trend to it, right? So this is very much similar to what we see when we, when we learn about item response models and we talk about conditional standard of error of measurement. I can also show you the difference of uh, the estimates of theta with the sum score itself. So this is just summing the number of item responses. Uh, this is on the, the zero to four scale because you can see zero is the lower bound and not uh, 10, I guess it was before, 10 items. And you will see a very similar trend here, nonlinearity, right? That's the logit at work. Any questions? Okay, should we compare normal estimates with binomial? This is where things get very interesting. This is where the impact of assumptions starts to really take hold. So these are the, the posterior mean estimates. And on the x-axis, we have the binomial assumption. And on the y-axis, we have the normal assumption. 
What do you see about this plot that looks interesting to you? I see several features, personally. Well, it's logistic. Yeah, it's nonlinear, right? Turns out, that's the link function, right? We put a nonlinear link function on, sure enough, the relationship between the two is not going to be linear either, right? Because units in logits are not units in identities, effectively. It's a little bit weaker than that. But, um, the other part of it is take a look at the maximum. In the normal model, the maximum value was above three. That binomial model, it's condensed. It's smaller, right? So this is clearly not the same estimate of the latent variable. Now think about what that means, right? If you and I are working side by side trying to sell people potatoes, which one do you want to sell people? They're different. The modeling choice is what made them different. Literally, the priors are the same, the data is the same. The only difference is one I said followed a discrete distribution and one I said follows a continuous distribution. And then you see this, not all thetas are the same. You, would, you may end up giving people different orders, right? If you look at everybody here on binomial, everybody right about one, there's quite a spread on normal, but not on binomial, right? So that means everybody about the same value if you use binomial might have a pretty wide distance between them. Maybe a half a standard deviation of people there. It's a big difference, right? Sorry. Pick the wrong distribution, you're half a standard deviation lower than I thought you were. Not a thing you want to tell someone that you just sold their theta to. I like that, selling thetas. That's my merch. We're in the business of selling thetas. Anyway. Um, yeah, I thought I had another plot here, but I don't. All right, any questions? That's, that's uh, binomial for us. No more questions. So did you like binomial? I see clapping. You like binomial? <laughs> I <laughs> Terry Ackerman used to make a joke. And he's, Terry, by the way, is, is giving a presentation 2 p.m. Friday uh, down in um, uh, N1, or South 110 uh, and on Teams. Um, but Terry used to describe if, if, you know, like teaching evaluations, like, oh, if students are coming up afterwards and asking you to autograph your PowerPoints, like you know you've done a good job. So. It never happened. It probably will never happen for me. But anyway, I enjoyed that joke he used to make. All right, so that's binomial. And what we learned from that, two, hopefully you learned two things. Number one, maybe three. Really flexible, easy distribution to code. Doesn't take more parameters. Doesn't have to change a whole. Number two, treats the data more properly. And when we treat the data properly, we start to see little differences in modeling. Right? And then number three, uh, like when we start to when when we, when we see those those differences can really have impact on what we give to people for results. Like if we're providing scores, if we're providing thetas, if we're trying to otherwise look at it, little differences in modeling assumptions. It draws into question the use of factor analytic models for Likert data, right? I think the case for that would be if you have Likert data, wh when would it be approximately the same? I believe if you had Likert data with a sufficient number of categories, maybe seven, five to six, seven, and the center of each response distribution was right in the middle. So it was unimodal and not skewed. When you get all that, all right, the normal models will approximate it. But how many times have you seen factor analysis applied to Likert data? all of them, <laughs> all of the times, right? I don't know about you, but pretty much, if we go through Lisa's class slides, I'm not gonna make you do this. If you go through her class where she's teaching it right now, or she's taught it this semester, like all the examples, Likert, 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 Likert. Just remember when you're doing Likert, that's not happening, that's happening, whoops. And that, that right there is happening, right? We get all this, and I haven't even talked about what happens parameters or anything else. So matching the model to the data, critically important. The other thing that'll blow your mind is when we do all of this, all the model fit statistics are based on the normal distribution too. Oh boy. So now 
I'm threatening the validity of anything done with factor analysis for li liquor data. I am. I'm going there. Because this is my class, and it's not under peer review. There are cases, I will admit, that will probably be approximately correct. All right. Let's move on. Let's talk about the categorical and multinomial distribution. I think I'll have time to set up the distribution a little bit, and then we'll dive into how to model it on Friday, okay? Okay, this is the multinomial distribution. Anybody seen the distribution function before? The PMF, probability mass function? That right there. When I see that, when I see this right here, n factorial, remember the factorial means that number times each successive integer smaller than it, down to one, not times zero, right? Uh, I wanna say N with emphasis. N, right? Over Y1, I could just, it has to be loud, right? It's almost like caps lock, right? But actually, the, the exclamation point is, is 1600, circa 1600's caps lock, right? That's like, that's how Shakespeare used to like, all caps his, like plays. Anyway, that's a bad joke. But it's subtle. Anyway. Um, and again, is the number of trials. The multinomial is a generalization of the binomial, so that the probability of success for any trial um, changes, or ch excuse me, no, no, so that there's more than one outcome for a given trial, right? So this is characterizing if you have, if we're rolling the dice, in binomial, we were looking for a one happening. Here we could say we have six outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. This will characterize the probability of each one of those outcomes happening for any one of the dice rolls, right? So what do I mean by that? P1 is the probability of like rolling a one. We have a different P for each one of those. And it's raised to the number of times that event occurred. Are you with me? It's a weird distribution because typically in psychometrics, just like in IRT, we said Bernoulli is a one trial binomial. Turns out we typically use a one trial version of a multinomial. A one trial multinomial in recent years, at least the last, as I was slowly getting into stuff that had been coming out more recently, is called the categorical distribution. It wasn't always called that, but think of it this way. We had binomial, and then a one trial binomial was a Bernoulli. We have multinomial, and a one trial multi multinomial is a categorical, right? And the difference between Bernoulli and categorical is in Bernoulli, there's only one outcome, one type of event. In a categorical, there can be multiple types of events. Does that make sense? All right. So for us, the number of trials is always set to one. Each item is a trial. And the number of events is the number of options we have on an item. So for our five-point Likert scale, we'll have five. Five options, one, two, three, four, five. Each one of those options will have a probability. And so what we see here is the probability mass function is actually, it looks compl a little complicated, but it's actually not that complicated. This term I raised the probability to is an indicator function, which means if the thing in the parentheses is true, it becomes a one, and if not, it's a zero. Well, it turns out with one trial, only one of these probabilities will have a one, and the rest will have zeros. So what we're left with is one probability, and it's the probability assumed by the p parameter for it. How's that work? All right. Of course, we have to have the probability summed to one to make it a proper distribution. But guess what we're going to do now? We, the complicating factor in this is now for each item, in theory, we have five probabilities that sum to one, right? Which means really we can model probably four of them. 
Because the last one, we just take one minus the sum of the four and we get the last probability. The distinction in psychometric models is how you model those four probabilities. So not just psychometric models. It's the same thing in uh, categorical data analysis or generalized linear models. This is, uh, we do this in, with educational data, so we have educational names of our models. If you're in the med school looking at outcomes from certain treatments in medicine, you'll use the same approach. And the distinction will be just different names, but the same assumptions that go into it. Okay. Um, so, how we put assumptions on each of those probabilities differentiates our models. So I talk about, there are sets of models out there. Um, I, I'm using just the big picture name that we use in psychometrics. So for instance, greater response models. Well, there's different variations of greater response models, but they pretty much have the same assumptions. Uh, some of them don't have slopes, like the Roche version. Some of them have an overall shift. There's all different, I don't want to get caught up in the minutia of it, but if you can focus on the bigger picture, which is all of them have a set of an ordering to the data, meaning that there's sort of a, an ordinal pattern. To it. So five is a higher score than a four and likewise. And so that is what we see. Turns out this these set of models is also called the proportional odds models, meaning that conditional on the latent trait, the odds of selecting a category, the next category, are equivalent, right? It's a shift. Uh, then there's a set of what we would call partial credit models. Note, note the language again. Partial credit. If we're in medicine, we wouldn't be using partial credit, right? This is telling you where this emanated from as a field. The model is the model, it's math. Math, I like to say math don't care, all right? It doesn't, it's just math. Um, but partial credit tells you, education model. It has, an, uh, pardon me, where greater response model enforces its order concept is on some of the parameters. I like to specify them with intercepts so we have a set of ordered intercepts. Uh, depending on which way we model it, they're either increasing or they're decreasing depending on the model function itself. Partial credit models actually have unordered versions of these, often with difficulty parameters. Uh, in each of these, a single loading appears. So regardless of which category you're modeling, the slope multiplying the latent variable is the same for both of them. Finally, we get into nominal response models. It's also emanated in psychometrics, Daryl Bach, 1972. It allows unordered intercepts and it has a set of loadings, one for each category. This is sometimes called the generalized logit model in categorical data, right? Same concept. Basically, we're coming up with a specific model for each of the categories, but because that sum to one constraint exists, we have to do something with it. All right, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you for your attention. I'll shut off everything, but if you have questions, just help, help come up after class. And remember, I have office hours today from two to four. And if nobody's there, I might wrap up early. So if you want to find me, come find me and until I'll talk until I, I'm all done. So thank you to all online. Thank you to everybody on, in person. Stay warm.